Part 3. The Obsession Called Disease Things are not what they seem. Investigators say that our ups and downs are due to the varying moods of the thyroid gland. Then do they, and even you and I, look about for some method of balancing this all-important dignitary? The only rule to ensure balance to any gland, organ, or what have you, is to recognize that the Almighty has it under control. And this is not a remote, but a close, constant, exclusive control. Who is the Almighty? He is the dramatic name for the universal intelligence, animation, and power we call God. Sometimes we refer to him as mind, life, and principle united. But regardless of the name, the Almighty exists watchfully determined not only to establish but maintain order in the lives and in the affairs of his people. So irrevocably set is he to have his way that he silences all opposing wills and forces. His presence extends to all the parts and doings of men and women. Nothing is too tiny, nor is anything too immense, for him to bring into line with perfection. So intimately related is he to you, that he and you are one. Happily, he is the one, his the only ego. You seek safety by insisting that his presence envelops you. You could gain more than safety. You could take on animation and intelligence without limit if you would admit that his presence is your very being. Why not make the admission? It will work the overthrow of your limitations and frustrations. It will work the overthrow of your ills and sorrows. It will go so far as to mitigate the appearance of years if you have reached that period called age. It does not make any difference what you name the things about you or what you name the things within you. Even when you do your best, groping about in the mistiness of the world, you fall short of according them their deserved dignity. Hence, whether you call a thing thyroid or pituitary or wheelbarrow, matters little. There is nothing in a name. But there is everything in the fact that the Almighty controls and directs the thing and its function, peacefully and undeviatingly. By the way, have you ever tried to push a loaded wheelbarrow? Probably not. But if you have, you have discovered that it is a willful conveyance. It never overlooks an opportunity to tip one way or the other and spill its contents as though bent on escaping responsibility. But the strong, steady arms of the man in charge hold the wheelbarrow in balance and drive it to its destination. This is what the Almighty does to those members and those functions of ours we so inadequately understand and so sadly misname material. He propels them without waver or hesitation. Thus do they operate unlaboredly and mightily. Misname or misinterpret form and function, if in your maturity of judgment you must. Call them material or nothing, if you will. They still remain something, something sublime and undefiled. The recognition of this fact brings healing, for healing consists in finding that in place of the supposed stress or pain or disorder is the uninterrupted harmony of being. During the past few days or weeks, 
we have been talking more or less about the belief of disease as opposed to the fact of health. Maybe it will be well to write down some of the statements made in that connection so that you may have them at hand to read over from time to time. Why is it that everyone instinctively resists sickness and infirmity? Simply because no one can believe that they are genuine. No one can figure out how there can be mortality or infirmity when God is life and therefore life triumphant is all in all. Resistance to disease is made successfully only when the resister begins to see that they are not true, that at most they are mesmeric states which can be broken by the realization that life is sound and eternal. Life is sound and eternal, you know, because it is self-existent, never created, and never expendable. Every individual takes on this inviolable life. It is in him and through him. It is his. Therefore, there is no denying that the life, the entity of every man and woman, is established for all time. Indeed, every individual is a manifestation or expression of this abiding life. Life cannot be seen or appreciated apart from living creatures. Animate beings, of which man is the highest, are visible exhibitions of otherwise invisible life. Hence it is that man is the temple of life, speaking figuratively, or the expression or manifestation of life, to use the direct form of conversation. For anyone to contemplate and reason out these truths is at least to begin to dissipate the supposition that he is sick. Life cannot be slackened or unduly quickened. It knows no haste, no lethargy, no corruption. And you are this life expressed or in action. To realize these facts is not only to lift the mesmerism which is interfering with one's good health, but to radiate an influence which will benefit others on whom his thought rests. And one can quite easily cultivate the habit of thinking and talking along such healthful lines pretty constantly and at the same time refuse to accept the suggestions of distress and suffering. Disease may keep putting forth its insinuations of pain and weakness. You and I have to be still more industrious in talking the above truths to them 